Most Star Trek fans can quote the various episodes where characters cross over from one series to the next. Whether it was Picard on DS9, or Barkley on Voyager, or even Spock in the J.J. Abrams Trek movies, they're all common knowledge. But what about the crossover that most people don't even know happened? Hello and welcome to Truth or Myth. In today's episode, we're taking a look at a little-known, seldom-referenced Star Trek crossover that never should have happened. In the late 1980s, you could count on very few things. Technology was changing and evolving at a growing and incredible rate. But one thing you could count on was wholesome television sitcoms. With shows like Different Strokes and Cheers dominating the 80s, it's a wonder that crazier crossovers didn't happen all the time. So what, out of all the great shows, decided to make a crossover with the next generation, you ask? Well, that show was none other than Webster. You may be leap without taking a look. Never thought forever was the best I could do. It was you, me, you. It was you. Yes, that's right. The Emmanuel Lewis sitcom that was created to rival different strokes actually crossed over with the Star Trek universe. Webster aired on ABC from September 16, 1983 until March 10th, 1989, and was created by Stu Silver. The show, with low production costs, was generally a success and lasted six seasons, mostly due to the adorability factor of Emmanuel Lewis himself. I remember watching this show as a kid and loving it, but when I decided to do this video, I thought, hey, let me pull out my old VHS tapes, play them through the computer VHS player, and get reacquainted with the awesome show. Boy, was that a mistake. I couldn't do it. The show did not age well. The jokes were obvious and not even funny. And although that doesn't change my childhood love for the show, I would not recommend it at your next viewing party. So anyhow, after four seasons, Webster was moved to syndication via Paramount. Starting to see the connection here? Even though Webster managed to hit its hundredth episode at the end of its fourth season, Paramount decided to exercise their option to keep the show in production for two more seasons. When it became clear that the sixth season would be the last of the series, they needed a finale. Unfortunately, and trust me, it's unfortunate, the series writers and production staff had been mostly let go and the whole series was winding down fairly quickly. The problem was, they still needed the finale. So with that, the remaining Webster staff rushed next door and made a deal with the TNG showrunners that would see the infamous episode come into production. And with that background information out of the way, let's get to the show. So the episode starts out on a rainy day with Webster playing video games on a very old and very nicotine-stained computer. It should be noted that Emmanuel Lewis is 17 at this time, but is playing a 12-year-old. I'm not sure if you care, but I thought I'd throw that one out there. And in true sci-fi fashion, the magical lightning initiates an animated transporter effect that beams the 17-year-old, 12-year-old to the Starship Enterprise Bridge in the 24th century, where an extra runs in to apprehend the intruder. Actually, the only funny thing about this episode is this particular extra. We'll call him over-enthusiastic extra from here on out. Anyhow, back to what is laughingly called the story. Worf begins his interrogation of the supposed boy, but of course, doesn't inform the senior staff of any of the happenings, nor do any of them ever show up, even throughout the red alert sequences in the entire episode. If you're like me and still watching the episode, you'll notice the lighting on the bridge is very different, and I found it to be very distracting during this Webster episode. My guess is the production staff of Webster did the lighting and not the TNG crew. So another extra takes the joystick from Webster and goes to have it repaired for him while the over-enthusiastic extra scans the kid with bad special effects. And finally, the Science 2 officer gives Worf the all-clear that the intruder is unarmed. Right, because Worf was so worried about the intruder that he couldn't even be bothered to move from the tactical station. It's like rascals all over again. Finally, Worf decides to move to the command area, 
and he and Webster get into a social interactions and customs discussion. Because you know, it makes sense that a Klingon would suddenly want a lesson from a 17-year-old, 12-year-old boy who just beamed in from the past. Moving on, not quickly enough, Webster graces us with his awesome dance moves, which immediately spurs over enthusiastic extra into action to contain the intruder. Either that, or he's joining in with his interpretive dance. I mean, look at this. Jazz hands. So then we get to the real point of the episode. And we find out it's a flashback episode. That's right. They use TNG to bookend their flashback series finale. Everyone remembers Shades of Grey, right? The TNG flashback episode that ended season two? Well, this episode makes that one look like the best episode of Trek ever. So anyhow, flashback, flashback, flashback. Almost five minutes of flashback, actually, before we get to our next scene back on the bridge, where Worf decides to tell Webster it's not possible to send him back, and bam, commercial break. Being on the edge of my seat for the three minute break, wondering what will happen to Webster, when the show actually comes back, we quickly find out Worf was just punking the teen preteen. And what he actually meant was it wasn't possible to return him right now. Phew. I thought for a minute maybe they were going to replace Wesley with him. So Worf also takes the opportunity to explain just where the hell everyone is, since there's like four whole people on the bridge, and of course, discuss the subject of fun. Since we know fun is always on the Klingon's mind. This segues right into another flashback scene, which thankfully isn't as long as the first, and is all about Webster learning to mosey. Sadly, not out of the episode though. So more back and forth between the two, and yeah, I'm not giving you much details, I know. But you have to understand, this is a really bad episode. And not just by Star Trek standards. It's hard for me to keep interest about the same topics being discussed over and over again. Just how long would you actually think that the two could talk about fun? <laughs> Worf talking about fun. Another flashback, this time taking us to a helicopter where Webster says, Beam me up, Scotty, because that's a helicopter reference for sure. Then back to the Enterprise and it's red alert, since they're having trouble escaping a planet's gravitational pull. Geez, the ship's abilities really go downhill when Picard's not in the center seat. Am I right? Speaking of Picard, the Red Alerts see him bust out onto the bridge demanding a status report and pissed that a 17-year-old, 12-year-old is casually roaming the bridge. Oh wait, no, he doesn't. In fact, he doesn't even call the bridge. Meh, it's okay. Overenthusiastic Extra has the situation well in hand. And commercial break. And when we come back, the Red Alert is over and we pick up with more of the fun conversation like nothing ever happened. Finally, we find out that the Enterprise has cleared Antares when a voice comes over the intercom from Engineering telling Worf they have. Lieutenant Worf, this is Engineering. We are clear of Antares. Since it's not like Worf is sitting at the op station or anything. Anyhow, more conversation, another really long flashback of mostly running montages, and we're finally at the end of the episode. Yes! <clears throat> Red-shirted Extra brings Webster back the joystick, and Worf makes a Wizard of Oz joke, and Webster beams himself back to his room. When we cut to his room, however, Webster is in bed waking up from what appears to be a dream. That's right, apparently it was all a dream for him, but a nightmare for the audience. But wait, it's a fake out, because from under the covers, Webster pulls out the repaired joystick that just happens to have a huge repair tag that tells us it was repaired by the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Yeah, alright, I'm done. As I'm sure you've guessed, I'm not a great supporter of this crossover. It's ridiculous and predictable of the Webster series, but a huge step down for Star Trek The Next Generation. The lighting is wrong, the characters are all wrong, etc, etc, etc. Now, I get this was a sitcom. 
that was generally supposed to be viewed by children. But it's obvious that no one really put much thought into the episode or understood TNG at all. If they had, this episode might have become a special little treasure or a cult classic gem that we would all be discussing nowadays. But what we get instead is a pile of garbage that the episode continues to relight over and over again. Is it canon? That's a good question, and I'll leave it up to you to decide. Everyone knows I'm a stickler for canon, but I'll be interested to hear everyone's opinions in the comments below. Either way, one thing I can say with 100% confidence is it was a horrible way for Webster to end. And the showrunners of that show should be ashamed. And that might explain why this episode is buried and very hard to find. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth. I've already asked for your opinion on the canon question, so I won't pull a Webster and ask you again. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel though, so you won't miss a single video re-release. Thanks again for watching, live long and prosper.